So hey guys, welcome to our channel The Fanfic Club. And also welcome to the another amazing story on what if Naruto was descendants of the sons. Here is short summary. Cast out of Olympus with his powers bound, Apollo learned the life of humans in the elemental nations and found love and a family. When he was forced away, he vowed to return, but when he did, he was horrified at the treatment of his son. The wrath of the son is not to be trifled with and Naruto is born of two sons. But before we start, if you want more amazing stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Also if possible share this video with your friends. Now let's start the story. It was the night of the Kayubi festival in Konohagakure. There was no moon in the sky that night, but the shinobi and civilians did not let that detract from their festivities, for this was the celebration that honored the defeat of the Kayubi no Kitsune at the hands of the Yandaimi Hokage. Every year, the villagers threw a grand festival and partied long into the night, but despite all of this, there was one shinobi that never enjoyed the festivities. In the shadows of an alleyway, a blonde teen was hiding inside a dumpster, trying to keep quiet so that the villagers would not find him. Why was he hiding from the villagers you ask? Well he was not a criminal or a troublemaker, well sometimes that last one, but the villagers always tormented him on the night of this festival. The reason for this, was because of a great burden he had been tasked with bearing since the day of his birth, which happened to be the same day of the festival. You see, the Kayubi was a massive being of powerful chakra, and such a being could not be killed or contained by normal means, so the Yandaimi used a powerful seal to imprison the beast within an infant child. That child was Naruto. Because of this, the villagers would add an extra event to the festival, which they dubbed, the Fox Hunt. As the name implied, it involved the villagers chasing down the young Naruto, trying to finish the Yandaimi's work. Crap! muttered Naruto as he huddled in the dumpster. Why does this always happen? His breath caught in throat as several kanai pierced through the dumpster with paper bombs attached to them, forcing the blonde shinobi to make a hand seal and leap from the dumpster as it erupted in flames. There he is, yelled the chunin that had thrown the kanai, after him. Cage bunshin no jutsu, yelled Naruto as he created a dozen copies in an attempt to slow down the mob so he could escape. Things were looking dark for Naruto that night, but one must always remember. The night will always end, and the sun will rise to dispel the darkness with its light. Apollo, Greek god of the sun, sat on the stone head of the Yandaimi Hokage looking out at the village with a nostalgic smile. The Greek god had been to the elemental nations many years before, but back then, he had not been the person he was now. It had began when Apollo had, in an act of arrogance, cast madness upon the giant hunter Orion, causing his death at the hands of a scorpion sent by Gaia. To teach his son a lesson, Zeus had cast Apollo out of Olympus and into the elemental nations with his powers bound, leaving him in the form of a human child. Taking the name, Minato Namikaze, Apollo made a life for himself in this new land, becoming a shinobi of Konoha and eventually falling in love with a fiery red-headed kunoichi named Kashina Uzumaki. In this new world, Apollo had found love that he had not felt since he had met the naiad Daphne, and, after a while, Kashina began to return his affections, leading them to conceive a child. He even regained some of his old powers, thanks to Kashina's skill with her clan's Fuenjutsu, allowing him to gain the title of Yellow Flash, due to the application of those skills. Unfortunately, this happy life was not to last, as Minato had been elected to replace Hiruzen Serutobi as the Yandaimi Hokage, and on the night of his son's birth, the Kayubi no Kitsune attacked the hidden village that had become his second home. Minato knew he had to seal the Kayubi in an infant child, and, having learned humility and compassion during his time here, he knew that he could never ask another family to sacrifice their own child, so he called upon the Shinigami of this world to take his soul in exchange for sealing the Kayubi into his son, Naruto. Upon the completion of the seal, Minato expected to find himself in the stomach of the so-called Death God, but instead opened his eyes and found himself in the throne room of Olympus, a god once more. Zeus explained to the bewildered god that, upon committing a selfless act of sacrifice for the village, the binding placed upon his powers was gone and he had become a god again. Apollo begged Zeus to send him back so he could save his wife, but the lord of Olympus informed him that the passageway between the worlds would not open again for many years. And so, the sun god waited, waiting for the chance to return and find his family. I'm back, said Apollo before feeling a familiar presence and vanishing in a flash of light. The god of the sun appeared in between the mob and an injured Naruto in a blinding flash, 
causing the mob to screech to a halt, lest they ram into the man. Who the hell are you? asked one man as he brandished a cleaver. The Olympian ignored the civilian in favor of examining the wounded boy that the mob had been pursuing. Immediately he recognized who he was, after all, he had his looks and, surprisingly enough, the aura of a Greek demigod mixed with something he had only felt from Kashina when they were together. Seeing all the injuries on his son caused anger to burn through him like the sun itself. Turning to the mob, Apollo's eyes blazed with the solar fire as he glared at them, his fury emanating off him in waves, leaving the pavement dry and cracked. Just what the Hades have you done to this boy? growled Apollo, pure anger lacing his every word. What's it to you? laughed a random Jonan that had joined in on the hunt. He's just the demon brat. We're just finishing what the Yandaimi started. What the Yandaimi started, muttered Apollo before his form was shrouded in light, transforming his appearance to that which he had all those years ago. What in all the hells makes you think this is what I wanted? snarled Minato Namikaze as he faced the villagers. Yandaimi sama! exclaimed the shinobi, but he was silenced when Minato shoved a glowing hand through his chest, leaving a cauterized hole where the man's heart would have been. I'll ask again, said Minato, what made you think that trying to kill my son is what I wanted? Your son! exclaimed the mob in shock and horror, but before they could react further, several masked Anbu jumped down and restrained them, before a busty blonde woman wearing a green robe walked up with a man with long white hair and another with gray hair and a mask that covered the lower half of his face. Sensei! exclaimed the man with the mask. Kakashi-san, Jiraiya, said Minato as he addressed the two men. Maybe you can explain what has happened here. Minato kun, said Jiraiya in shock, the white haired man, before he collected himself, I'm afraid that, after your death and against the Sandame's best wishes, the village did not see your son as the hero you intended him to be. Instead, they saw him as the fox in human skin and tried to end him. And what happened to the Sandame? asked Minato, he would never stand for this. The women then stepped forward with a somber look. He was killed by his former student, Orochimaru. The council elected me to take his place as Godem. Minato nodded, recognizing the woman as Tsunade Senju of the Sanin, one of Hirazan's, the Sandame's, old students, known as the greatest shinobi of her generation alongside her teammates, Jiraiya and Orochimaru. I am disappointed in you all, said Apollo as he shifted to his normal form and picked up his son, allowing his light to heal the boy's wounds, you should have protected him. He was the hero that has kept you all safe, not me. Naruto will be leaving with me tonight, and neither of us will be returning. Before anyone could react, the god disappeared in a flash of light, leaving the shinobi feeling like they just fucked up something big. The next day, the sun did not rise over Konoha, nor did it any day following. As the shinobi faced the eternal darkness, they realized that they had made a terrible mistake, and it was too late for them to fix it. When Naruto opened his eyes he immediately noted that he was not in Konoha anymore. He noticed he was lying on a rather comfortable mattress in a white building with sunlight streaming through the windows. The building's design did not resemble any hospital or home that he had seen in Konoha. There were some flowers growing in pots in the windows, and cots against the walls with weapons and coats hanging on hooks beside them. WH where am I? The blonde Genin groaned as he began to get up. Easy there, said a male voice causing Naruto to turn and see an older teen walking up, you were in some bad shape when Chiron brought you here. Who are you? What is this place? asked Naruto, how did I get here? One question at a time, said the teen, my name is Lee Fletcher. You're in cabin 7 of Camp Half-Blood. As for how you got here, you were sent here by your father apparently. That's impossible, said Naruto, my parents died the day I was born. I'm afraid that is incorrect my boy said an older man as he rolled in on a wheelchair, my name is Chiron, and your father is very much alive. You knew my father? asked Naruto. I've met him personally, said the Chiron, but I think that this will be a bit more convincing for you. He said your blood would be the key. The man pulled a scroll out of a pocket and handed it to Naruto, getting a curious look from Lee Fletcher as the Konoha shinobi took the scroll and looked it over. This scroll, said Naruto as he saw a familiar crest, it's from Konoha. Chiron and Lee looked on as Naruto bit his thumb and swiped some blood on it, causing the scroll to unseal itself and allow the blonde Jinchuriki to read its contents. Naruto, you must have a lot of questions for me. Let me first say that I had no intentions of abandoning you or your mother that night, 
but powers beyond my control force the issue. To put it simply, I am not from the elemental nations. I was sent there as a punishment, which I won't bore you with the details of, and when I sealed the Kyubi away, I was pulled back to my home dimension, the very place you find yourself in now. Also, if you haven't already guessed, my name in the elemental nations was Minato Namikaze, the Yandaimi Hokage of Konoha. I truly wish I did not have to place the burden of being the jailer of the Kyubi upon you, but I could not ask another family to sacrifice their child if I was unable to do the same. I had intended for you to be seen as a hero, but the fools only saw you as your prisoner. It was because of this stupidity that I brought you to this dimension. This world is called Earth, and here gods and monsters run free. My true name and title is Apollo, god of the sun, music, healing, and prophecy, which makes you a demigod. Congrats. You'll probably start noticing some new abilities popping up due to your demigod blood being awakened, not to mention what you've received from your mother's side, but I'll leave that for her to explain. You will need to stay at Camp Half Blood and learn to fight against the new threats in this world and to learn how to function here. Earth is very different from the elemental nations, so you'll need to learn as much as you can to avoid any problems. Luckily, the Cage Bunshin no Jutsu is a good way to study since the memories of a Cage Bunshin are transferred back to the original. Luckily I placed a blessing on you so you won't have any problems with the language barrier, at least verbally. Anyway, I've got to be going. I hope to see you one day. Grow up to be a fine person and a mighty hero. Your father, Minato Namikaze, Apollo, Naruto blinked some tears out of his eyes as he finished reading the scroll. His father was alive and he loved him. Not only that, but he was the son of his hero, the Yandaimi, who also happened to be a god. I understand that this may be a lot to take in, said Chiron, but your family here will help you through this. I have family here. Asked Naruto in surprise. Indeed, said Chiron, in fact, every resident of Cabin 7 is a demigod child of Apollo, making them your half siblings. Really? Asked Naruto with hope. Quite, said Chiron, once you get settled, we can begin helping you get acquainted with this new world. Right, said Naruto. But after seeing giant toads, snakes, sand tanuki, and such, how bad could it be? Chiron simply chuckled and rose from his chair, revealing the lower body of a proud horse as he stepped out of the magic chair. Naruto stood there for a moment, his eyes wide and his jaw agape as he stared at the centaur in shock, before his eyes rolled back and he promptly passed out. Chiron, immortal trainer of heroes, simply chuckled and turned toward Lee Fletcher. Why don't you take your new brother inside and find a bunk for him? This has all been a bit much I think. Right, chuckled the counselor of Cabin 7 as he carried the blonde shinobi indoors. Naruto awoke an hour later and was taken to the big house where he met Mr. D, the director of Camp Half-Blood, and was informed about the new world he had found himself in. Naruto was quite surprised to learn of the existence of Greek gods and monsters, but he quickly accepted it, due to him having an immortal demon fox sealed in his gut. In fact, Naruto was eager to learn how to fight monsters like the Minotaur, Dracons, and the Hydra. After all, fighting monsters and being a hero is what he wanted to do as a shinobi. Of course, he had to learn about living on Earth first, thus came the lessons. At first, Naruto was quite against having to learn things like reading ancient Greek and sitting through lectures about Greek mythology, but once he learned he could have his cage Bunshin do so in his place, as their memories would be transmitted back to him anyways, he agreed. Those were the only activities that he had any problems with. Naruto found that he excelled in the physical activities, thanks in no small part to him being trained as a shinobi and loved every minute of them. In fact, he was forced to fight with a handicap during unarmed combat and wrestling, with jutsu banned of course, and he outshot even his brothers in the Apollo cabin in archery, and he was actually asked to help teach the tracking skills class after he showed his efficiency in the subject. Naruto never thought tracking Tora would prove to be beneficial. With all the activities, it wasn't long until Friday came and Naruto learned about the weekly tradition of capture the flag. So, this is like some sort of combat training? Asked Naruto as he tried on some light armor that consisted of a breastplate and gauntlets and greaves. In a way, said Lee as he tested the string on his bow, it's a good way to get experience fighting in the real world, but it's more of a challenge between cabins. The two cabins holding the flag's trade favors to gain alliances and form two teams whomever can capture the other team's flag and bring it back to their territory, wins. Cool, said Naruto. Campers called out Chiron, it is time for our capture the flag match. This week, 
The Hephaestus and Hermes cabins hold the flags. The usual rules apply. There will be no maiming. Any prisoners are not to be bound or gagged, and the first team to bring the other cabin's flag across the boundary, wins. The two teams quickly split up and moved to take strategic positions in their territory, waiting for the ideal moment to move once the match had been started. Hermes cabin was allied with Ares cabin, Demeter cabin, and Athena cabin, while the Hephaestus cabin had recruited Apollo's, Aphrodite's, and Dionysius's cabins. Hey Naruto, said Charles Beckendorf, counselor of Hephaestus cabin, you're some kind of ninja from another world, right? That's right, said Naruto with a nod. You got a plan, Charlie? asked Lee. Well, said Beckendorf, since Hermes recruited Athena, we'll need to come up with some kind of distraction that will throw off whatever plan they've got cooked up. Something unexpected and unpredictable, said Lee. That's right. Unpredictable, huh? said Naruto as a grin split his face. I think I can manage that. I wasn't called Konoha's most unpredictable hyperactive knucklehead ninja for nothing. Cage Bunshin no Jutsu. Naruto made a cross sign with his hands and several dozen copies of the blonde genin appeared in puffs of smoke. Now that's cool, said Beckendorf, can all ninjas do that kind of stuff? The cage bunshin no jutsu is a bit of a high level technique, said Naruto. If only you could shapeshift, chuckled Lee. About that, said Naruto with a smirk. When the conch horn sounded, the blue team, led by Hermes' cabin, quickly spread through the forest, making their way to the opposing team's territory. A group of Ares campers were almost to the river when they saw someone moving. It's Beckendorf, yelled one of the children of Ares, get him. The teens charged after the enemy leader, noting that the son of Hephaestus was a lot more quick and agile than he normally was in this kind of terrain. Just as they were catching up to him, the five burly demigods felt the ground give way and wound up sprawled at the bottom of a pitfall. Better luck next time, said. Beckendorf, as he transformed back into Naruto with a poof of smoke before running off. Did you know he could transform? asked one of the trapped demigods, getting groans in response. At the same time, a group of Hermes cabin members were sneaking through the bushes in a different part of the forest. Suddenly, several arrows struck the ground in front of them, causing the demigods to jump back. Hey there, said Naruto as he sat on a branch with a bow in his hands, nice weather, nay? It's that new kid, said a son of Hermes as the group drew their swords. Uzumaki Naruto, at your service, said Naruto as he shot three arrows at them that exploded as they neared the demigods, resulting in a thick cloud of smoke covering them. When the smoke cleared, the campers were lying on the grass snoring peacefully thanks to the sleeping gas they had breathed in. The prankster king of Konoha took a moment to admire his handiwork before moving off to find another group of victims, I mean campers. Naruto was sitting in a clearing laughing as the memories of his cage bunshin came back to him and he saw the results of the hasty traps and ambushes he had set up for his team. Suddenly, his instincts screamed at him to dodge and he went flat against the ground, feeling the wind of a kick pass through the area his head had been in, but there was nobody there. Great, sighed Naruto as he leapt to his feet, some kind of genjutsu. I found you, yelled a female voice and Naruto saw a girl he recognized as Clarice LaRue, head counselor of Cabin 5 home to the children of Ares. Seeing that she was covered in dirt and orange paint, Naruto figured she must have been part of the group to fall into the pitfall and get a can of paint upturned onto them, she probably climbed out and now wanted payback. Spinning her spear over her head before stopping with it at the ready, the daughter of Ares let out a battle cry and charged at the Jinchuriki demigod. Naruto quickly pulled out two kanai knives made of celestial bronze that the Hephaestus cabin had whipped up for him, and parried her furious spear thrust, his eyes widening as he felt a jolt of electricity shoot through his arms, making them feel numb. A lightning spear? He asked. That's so cool. Bad for me, but still cool. Pocketing his new kanai, Naruto quickly made three more cage bunshin and charged at the girl, noting that one of his bunshin was dispelled before it even reached her. Clarice attacked the cage bunshin with her spear but they deftly dodged the attacks and delivered powerful punches to her armor, knocking her around while yelling, Yuzu ma ki. Finally, Naruto leapt up into the air and delivered a dropkick to her helmet, Naruto Renden. Clarice fell to the ground, thankfully protected from any serious injury due to her armor, but still knocked for a loop, and Naruto landed softly on his feet, but before he could react, he felt that invisible force grab his arm and twist it into a painful lock behind his back. Alright, said a girl's voice in his ear, 
Now call off all the copies you have running around the forest. Before Naruto could answer, Shiron's voice could be heard, calling the victory of the Apollo cabin in taking the flag. Too late, said Naruto, causing the girl to release him and pull off a Yankees baseball cap, becoming visible again with a huff. Everyone watching had to pick their jaws off the floor as the leader of the Shinto pantheon released the stunned blonde demigod and smiled. I've watched you grow into such a fine shinobi, Naruto, said Amaterasu, when Apollo came to me that night and revealed what those monsters had done to you, I wholeheartedly agreed with his decision to take you away. You you're my grandmother? asked Naruto in shock, but how? Oh, silly me, said Amaterasu with a small laugh, I should elaborate. You see, the Uzumaki clan has always held my blessing, from the days of Asura Otsutsuki, the progenitor of the Uzumaki and Senju clans. Occasionally, I would take mortal form and visit his descendants, walking among them, and it was during one of these visits that I married a member of the Uzumaki clan and conceived your mother, Uzumaki Kashina, my first demigod child. I blessed her union with Apollo's mortal form and used of my powers to restore to him a fraction of what had been sealed by Zeus. I've so waited for the chance to see you for myself. I can't believe it, said Naruto in shock. Wait, if my father's a god, and my mother's a demi goddess, what does that make me? Special, Naruto kun, said Amaterasu as she knelt down and placed a hand on his cheek, as you always will be to me. Wait a moment, said Naruto, the gathered members of Camp Half Blood being forgotten due to his meeting his maternal grandmother for the first time. Why does that black flame technique that Itachi Teme used to have the same name as you? I mean it seems a bit weird. Ah yes, the powers of the Uchiha clan's Sharingan, said Amaterasu with a touch of disdain, as a frown crossed her beautiful face, that is a lengthy tale, a tale that dates back to the days before the shinobi, all the way back to Hagoromo Otsutsuki, known to the shinobi world, as the sage of the six paths. The sun goddess took a seat on the ground, and the rest of the gathered audience did the same, all of them enraptured by the story that was now unfolding. In the later days of his life, said Amaterasu as she began her tale, the sage needed to choose a son to pass on his legacy to. Many thought that his older and more talented son, Indra, would be selected as the one to inherit his father's power, but the sage opted to choose his younger son, Asura, leaving his elder brother bitter and resentful. In his anger, Indra swore a feud against Asura and his descendants, going forward to seek out the goddess of the Shinto underworld, Izanami, and struck a deal, trading his soul for her granting him and his descendants, her eyes, merging them with the eyes Indra had inherited from the sage to create, the Mangekyo Sharingan, along with several powers which the upstarts opted to name after the Shinto pantheon, as they were mockeries of our own powers. So that's the origin of the Sharingan, said Naruto. If I may, Lady Amaterasu, said Chiron as he caught the goddess's attention, the Shinto pantheon has always distanced itself from the Olympian pantheon. Will that be changing due to your appearance here? Hum, said Amaterasu as she stood up, perhaps it is time for talks to be opened. It would give me a chance to see my son-in-law and Naruto here more often, but that is for another time. I will be returning to my realm now, Naruto-kun, but I have some gifts. Waving her hand, Amaterasu caused two items to appear on the ground. Picking up the first item, an old and dusty tome, Amaterasu turned to her grandson. This, said the goddess as she handed the book to Naruto, is your mother's record on her and your father's studies on Fuinjutsu. It is something I recommend reading. She then picked up the second item, a tanto with a bronze blade and a grey edge. This sword is from your father, commissioned personally by him from Hephaestus. It was forged from a unique alloy created from celestial bronze and chakra conducting metal from the elemental nations it is probably going to be easier for you to use than a standard Greek sword. Giving Naruto a final hug, the goddess stepped back, I expect great things from you, Naruto-kun, she said to her grandson, and I promise we will meet again. A bright light surrounded the leader of the Shinto pantheon, forcing all present to turn away, and when it faded, the goddess of the sun had vanished. Coughing into his hand, Chiron regained the attention of the gathered demigods. Well, said the centaur, this has indeed been the most eventful capture the flag game we have had in a while. It had been a few days since Naruto's claiming and the most, interesting capture the flag game the camp had seen since the last time the hunters of Artemis had visited. Even with Naruto being claimed as the grandson of Amaterasu along with being a child of Apollo, things hadn't changed for the blonde shinobi from another world. Well, almost. After their bout in the forest, 
Naruto had found himself a new friend, training partner in the form of the girl with the electric spear he had fought. She had cornered him after lunch one day and had introduced herself as Clarice LaRue, daughter of Ares. At first the blonde was worried that the rather muscular girl was going to get some payback for beating her in the forest, but instead she complimented him on his combat skill and asked if he wanted to train once in a while. This led to a good friendship, rivalry between the two as she taught him some tricks for his new blade and he helped her train against his cage bunshin. Some campers were a bit leery due to Naruto's dual lineage, but most of them didn't think much different of him. In fact, some of Apollo and Ares' cabin put a proposal to Chiron and soon enough, the shinobi demigod found himself teaching shinobi combat styles to demigods that wanted to learn, well, what could be taught without the use of chakra that is. For Naruto, things were looking up. He finally had a home and a family of half-brothers and sisters that cared for him, and he felt like he really belonged here. It was more than he had ever felt back in Konoha, even after Tsunade took over as Hokage. However, he couldn't help but feel an ominous sensation building in the pit of his stomach, and one night, which had storm clouds brewing on the edge of the camp's wards, he had a peculiar dream. Dream start Naruto found himself standing on a stone plateau overlooking a stormy sea. From his spot, he saw violent waves slam into the shore, tearing chunks out of the stone with their might. Suddenly, the sky parted and bolts of lightning struck down, blasting the sea's waves apart as if it was trying to wound the mass of water with its might. The sea seemed to roar in anger and the earth began to shake as the sea surged violently to smash against the bolts of lightning. Naruto watched this clash of the elements in shock and awe, wondering just what kind of dream this was, as he felt like he was awake, yet knew he was dreaming. He had never had dreams like this in Konoha. Just as the sea had kicked up waterspouts to combat the sky's lightning, the stone beneath Naruto's feet began to crack and split, causing hands of shadow to reach out and pull the teen into the earth, keeping him from moving due to the surprising strength the dark tendrils showed. As Naruto was pulled deeper into the earth, he heard a powerful voice echo from deep beneath the ground. Where is it? You must find it. The voice thundered the power behind it echoing through Naruto's very being as he was pulled into a cavern containing a strange garden, you must return what is mine. Return to me my. Dream end, ah! Yelled Naruto as he jumped up from his bunk, kanai in hand, causing his fellow cabin mates to jump back from trying to wake him up. Easy there, said Michael Yu, one of his fellow sons of Apollo, it was just a nightmare. Right, said Naruto, but it felt so real. Well, said Will Solace, another child of Apollo, children of the gods do tend to have the occasional prophetic dream due to our godly heritage. You might want to tell Chiron about it later. Right now, we need to get to ready positions. There's a beast approaching the boundaries in pursuit of a demigod. We might need to provide cover while others get him into safety. Right, said Naruto as he grabbed his kanai pouch, which had been refilled thanks to the Hephaestus cabin, and his bow and followed his cabin out into the night. Little did Naruto know that this event would mark the beginning of some of the biggest and most important things to happen since the founding of Olympus. When Naruto arrived with the other demigods, they were just in time to see a teen with black hair and green eyes impale a minotaur with one of its own horns, reducing the monster to gold dust that was scattered to the breeze, before said teen slumped to the ground. The daughter of Athena that had faced Naruto in the Capture the Flag game rushed forward with several medics from Apollo Cabin and they brought the boy into the camp borders, with Chiron instructing them to take him to the big house and be brought Ambrosia and Nectar to heal him. Naruto pushed aside thoughts of his nightmare as he created several cage bunshin to help get supplies for the healers, and soon the newcomer was resting peacefully in the big house. Is there anything else you need Chiron? Asked Lee as he and the others cleaned up. Not as of yet said the centaur, you should go and get some rest. Young Perseus is past the critical stage with thanks to you and your cabin's healers. All we can do is wait now. Why was he being chased by the man bull? Asked Naruto, recognizing the minotaur from his lessons at the camp, while also remembering the power of names and thus, avoiding using the true name of the beast. That would be because young Perseus is a demigod with an abnormally strong aura, said Chiron, which means more monsters are drawn to him with many of them being more dangerous than the average variety. Who his parent is, is hard to say at this point, but I do suspect his godly parent is a powerful one. Now, you all should get to bed. He will be well cared for at the big house. The gathered demigods nodded and headed back to their respective cabins, the memory of Naruto's strange nightmare forgotten due to all the excitement that had just happened. 
As Naruto headed to his cabin though, he noticed a young girl tending to the fire pit that was situated in the middle of the field the cabin stood in, causing him to stop in place and glance around. Strangely enough, he noticed that most of the other campers weren't even paying her any mind and she was dressed rather plainly, causing memories of his life before meeting people like Tuchi, Ayame, and Aruka, to resurface. With that in mind, the blonde shinobi demigod headed over to the camp fire pit where the girl sat. Yo, said Naruto as he walked up, is everything alright? The others are heading back to their cabins, so you might want to head in as well. The girl smiled, the glow from the fire causing a light to dance across her irises, and Naruto had to admit that she was rather attractive, right up there with Sakura, your concern is appreciated, but someone needs to remain and tend to the hearth. But it's gonna get kind of cold soon, said Naruto, and you can't stay up all night keeping the fire going. It is truly no trouble, said the girl kindly. Hum, said Naruto, wait. What if I made a cage bunshin and had it tend the fire for you? That way you could rest. The girl chuckled and gave Naruto a warm smile, I appreciate the offer, but I prefer to tend to the hearth myself. However, the company of your cage bunshin would be appreciated through the night. All right then said Naruto as he made a cross seal with his fingers and summoned a single cage bunshin that sat down next to the girl by the fire, have a good night then. Have a good night Naruto, said the girl as the blonde walked away, leaving her with his cage bunshin as she tended to the fire. Things were normal around camp for the next few days, but it wasn't long before that changed, and that was because the new arrival at the big house had woken up. Naruto had been helping his demigod siblings with some basic chores, mainly cleaning up their cabin and equipment, using cage bunshin to make the work easier on everyone, when he heard a loud blast coming from the camp bathrooms. Hurrying over, he saw the kid that had been fighting the Minotaur standing opposite of a pissed off Clarice, who, along with several of her cabinmates and a rather irate blonde girl that Naruto vaguely remembered from his first capture the flag. Naruto had a pretty good idea what had caused the loud noise, as it had looked like several toilets had erupted like geysers, drenching everyone except the new kid. Hey, he waved hesitantly, what's with all the commotion? TCH, growled Clarice as she turned to storm off, with the rest of her siblings following suit, I'll kick your ass this Friday, prissy. Once they had walked off, Naruto turned his attention to the other two campers, so, I'm assuming there was a fight or something that ended with the bathrooms exploding. Something like that, said the new kid before turning to the blonde girl, um, Sorry about what happened, he began, but the girl just huffed and walked off, brushing past Naruto as she did so, right. Ah, don't worry about it, said Naruto, she's always been a bit prickly. You're the kid who beat the man bull, right? I didn't catch your name by the way. I'm Naruto Uzumaki. Percy Jackson, said the new kid. Nice to meet you, said Naruto, come on, let me show you some of the best spots around camp. I think you're going to love it here. What do you mean? asked Percy, why are you so certain I'm staying? Where else would you go? asked Naruto, this is the safest place for kids like us. What? You mean mentally disturbed kids that blow up toilets? asked Percy skeptically. That was you! exclaimed Naruto, damn, you must be powerful, though I wonder who your parent is to give you that kind of abilities? My mom is a candy shop worker from East Harlem, said Percy flatly. Not talking about her said Naruto, I'm talking about your other parent. What, my father? asked Percy, mom always said he was lost at sea. That is a bit curious, but he's definitely alive and well, said Naruto, and he's the reason you're here. This is a camp for half-bloods. Isn't that a bit racist? asked Percy as he crossed his arms. No, not half-blood as in ethnicity, exclaimed Naruto, half-blood, as in half-human and half-divine. Divine? said Percy with a raised eyebrow. Yep, answered Naruto with a nod. As in God? Percy continued. Pretty much, nodded Naruto. My father is God. Confirmed Percy. Well not God, but rather, a God, said Naruto. You're kidding right? said Percy. Nope, said Naruto as he shook his head. This is a camp dedicated to the training and protection of the children of the gods, specifically the Greek pantheon. So, if I'm a half-blood like you say, frowned Percy, then who is my father? Dunno, shrugged Naruto, if he hasn't claimed you, then there is no real way to find out right now. Well, pressed Percy, who's your parent then? Naruto smiled and pointed towards the cabins, 
specifically one that seemed to brilliantly shine like gold when the sun hit it, to the point that it was rather blinding, Apollo, god of the sun, father of the demigod children in Cabin 7. It's kind of, bright, said Percy as he rubbed his eyes. I've been told dad has that kind of flair, shrugged Naruto. You've never met him? asked Percy, causing Naruto to frown slightly. No, he said sadly, I lost him and mom from the day I was born and didn't even know he was a god until he brought me to camp, and I was unconscious at the time. Sorry? offered Percy, realizing he had hit upon an uncomfortable subject. Don't worry about it, said Naruto, I have more family here than I ever had back home, and that is great. Now, let me show you those awesome things around camp that I mentioned. Percy didn't know what to make of this new place he found himself in. Naruto assured him that he'd get used to it, and despite the uniqueness of Camp Half-Blood's facilities being rather overwhelming, he was starting to find his place here. The camp had a lot of mundane activities like canoe races and archery lessons, and there were some more unique ones like physical combat and sword fighting. The former was one that Naruto seemed to be the best at, even among the children of Ares. It had been a few days since he had woken up at the big house, and Percy had been put in cabin 11 with the other unclaimed demigods. There wasn't a lot of space, but strangely enough, Percy hadn't felt this comfortable since the last time he was with his mom at Montauk before this past visit in the Minotaur attack. Every morning, he would wake up and head down to the dining pavilion for breakfast, then he would meet up with Annabeth for lessons on ancient Greek, and suffice it to say, Percy never thought that a kid with dyslexia would have had such an easy time learning a second language. After that, his schedule shifted a bit depending on the day. He would either help with lunch prep, help out at the camp store, clean the Pegasi stables, pick strawberries in the fields or help Polish armor, depending on what day it was. After that was various forms of combat training, and, aside from Pegasus riding, he really wasn't very good at any of them. His first archery attempt resulted in him learning some colorful new insults in ancient Greek as a dryad yelled at him for shooting her tree with a wayward arrow. The rest of his day proceeded at a similar pace, until after dinner when the campers would have tournaments in combat or volleyball, though Percy found that Naruto had been banned from everything except volleyball due to him wiping the floor with the competition on a regular basis. And finally came Friday evening when the campers prepared for capture the flag. So, we do this every week. Percy asked Luke as the members of Cabin 11 prepped their armor and weapons for the match. Every Friday, said Luke as he measured Percy's torso, you look like a 7, maybe an 8. Grabbing a bronze breastplate, the older demigod pushed it into Percy's hands, here, try this on. Percy raised an eyebrow at the request, but complied, strapping the armor on. Unfortunately, it wasn't a perfect fit, and Percy prayed that he wouldn't need to run anywhere wearing this, as it was definitely going to hinder his movements. It feels kind of weird, he commented, are you sure I have to wear this? Luke laughed, unless you want your friends in cabin 5 to destroy you, then I'd keep it on. You shouldn't have to worry too much though. We've got this match in the bag. Really? asked Percy, why? It took us almost a thousand promises and traded favors, but we managed to secure an alliance with Cabin 7, said Luke, we have Naruto on our side. Okay, said Percy skeptically, and that's good why. Are you kidding? laughed Luke, the kid's literally a one-man army and dominated his first capture the flag match. Hell, I really look forward to the next time the hunters of Artemis stop by if he sticks around. He's really that good? asked Percy. Trust me, said Annabeth as she walked up with a frown, speaking from experience, he is like a force of nature. You can't plan for him, so you just have to plan around him. Basically, said Luke, while we only have Apollo Cabin and Athena Cabin on our side, we're the ones at an advantage. Percy wasn't sure one demigod would make that much of a difference, especially when it sounded like virtually all the other cabins would be against them, but he deferred to the others, as they had been here longer. So, what's the plan then? asked Percy. Since you're new at this, I have an easy role for you, said Annabeth, you're on border patrol. When our one-man army kicks things off, it'll be your job to take care of any stragglers that try to flank us. If you say so, said Percy, but how will I know when things kick off? Oh, you'll know, said Luke, just listen for the chaos. So, this is boring, Percy muttered to himself as he paced along the banks of a creek that flowed through the forest. He had been patrolling his assigned location since the start of the match, and not much had happened since then, 
despite Annabeth and Luke indicating that having Naruto involved in this match meant that all hell ahem Hades would break loose. Still, Percy sighed, I wish they were clearer about what the signal would be when things kick off. Suddenly, almost as if in response to his thoughts, several muffled explosions were heard from the woods, along with several yells of indignation from various campers. I guess that's the signal, mused Percy as he listened to the chaos, sounds like they weren't kidding about the chaos. At that moment, Clarice burst into the clearing with several of her cabinmates, all of them well armed and sporting sinister smirks on their faces. Hey there, new boy, growled the daughter of Ares with a smirk, we're gonna get some payback for earlier. Really? groaned Percy, I seem to recall that you guys started this, or does memory loss run in the family too? You're gonna get it now, Prissy, growled Clarice as she charged at Percy, with her fellow children of Ares flanking the demigod, blocking off his exits. The daughter of Ares lunged at Percy, stabbing at him with the spear she wielded in her hand, moving with a surprising amount of speed for someone of her muscular bulk. Percy brought up his shield to defend himself, but it seemed that was the wrong move, as a numbing electric charge shot up his arm, causing him to drop the shield, leaving him open for a thrust that tore through his sleeve and left a shallow cut on his arm. Hey! Percy protested, no maiming. Looks like I'll be losing my dessert privileges then snarked Clarice as she readied her spear for another go. Percy backed away from the bigger girl, but thanks to her cabinmates blocking the way, he was forced to stumble into the river. As soon as he touched the water though, something changed. A surge of energy flowed through him, not like the shock from Clarice's spear though. This was invigorating and it filled him with power, and he felt the pain from his injuries fading away. Suddenly, the odds against him didn't look so bad. Clarice and her siblings noticed the change in his demeanor and rushed forward, eager to end this and get back to helping their allies take down the demigod force of nature that was Naruto Uzumaki, but, thanks to this new power up, Percy was having none of that. One of Clarice's demigod brothers swung his celestial bronze sword at Percy, but with the strange boost he had received, Percy deflected the blade with a swing from his own before bashing the edge of his borrowed shield into the demigod's face, his helmet keeping him from receiving a broken nose but the impact to his skull putting him out of the fight. Percy didn't stop there though, and he swung his leg out and swept the legs of another of Clarice's siblings before using the flat of his sword to ring the bell of another with a solid strike to her helmet. As the final child of Ares drew near, Percy quickly disarmed him with a quick technique that Luke had shown him during sword fighting class, before knocking him out with a good shield bash. You're dead! yelled Clarice in anger upon seeing what happened to her siblings. She couldn't believe that Percy had taken all of them down, but the evidence was right in front of her. Now, she had even more reason to want to take him down. The daughter of Ares lunged forward with her spear, but Percy dodged to the side, using his shield to catch the shaft of her weapon and cause it to swing wide before bringing his blade down on the wooden rod, cleaving it in two. Clarice stared at the remains of her weapon in shock before snarling at Percy and tossing aside the broken spear. She was about to lunge at him and try to take him on barehanded, when the sounds of yelling broke through her angry haze, and Luke burst through into the clearing holding the red team banner aloft. No! yelled Clarice, it was a trick, but it was too late, and as Luke crossed over the boundary line, the banner changed to a brilliant silver with the caduceus symbol of Hermes emblazoned on it, ending the match right there as Chiron blew his horn to signal their victory. Clarice stormed off in a huff and Percy relaxed a bit only to jump out of his skin when Naruto leapt down behind him and slapped him on the back with a huge grin. Nice job Percy, he said with a smile, you really showed them, and thanks to you we had a clear shot at the flag. Yeah, muttered Percy, I just had to get clobbered to do it. I guess it was lucky that they came after me when they did. Luck had nothing to do with it, came Annabeth's voice nearly causing Percy to jump in surprise as the girl materialized out of thin air next to Naruto, a Yankees baseball cap in her hand, everything went according to plan. How the hell did you do that? exclaimed Percy before catching on to the latter part of her sentence, wait, what do you mean, plan? Are you saying you wanted Clarice and her siblings to attack me? Wanted? No, said Annabeth, did I expect them to do so and plan around it? I might have. Besides, I was nearby in case things got bad, not that you needed it though. You really took them down hard. Surprising for a new arrival, unless you're Naruto of course. She finished with a sigh, he is practically chaos personified. It's better to point him at a target and plan around him. 
Percy sighed and was about to step out of the river and rejoin the members of Cabin 11 when a loud animalistic growl split the clearing, causing the gathered demigods to cease their celebrations and scramble for their weapons while Chiron shouted orders to the campers. Not long after, a large black hound leapt through the trees and landed in front of Percy's position, the monster's form resembling a snarling mastiff with eyes that glowed like burning coals, fur as black as a moonless night, and a muscular body the size of an average sized rhinoceros. Percy couldn't help but step back as the beast snarled at him, causing him to trip over the bank of the river as he exited the waters, falling backwards on the banks as the creature closed in. The monster quickly lunged at Percy, its claws poised to tear through the demigod's flesh, and for a moment, everything slowed down for Percy and he held his hands out in front of him to defend himself, and suddenly, he felt the same strange tugging feeling that he had felt when the toilets had exploded and drenched Clarice and suddenly, water surged forth from the river slamming into the monster and knocking it to the ground. Before it could get up and recover, a cluster of bronze-tipped arrows were shot into the creature's neck courtesy of Chiron's bow, causing the beast to disintegrate into dust. What, was that? exclaimed Percy, but to his surprise, all of the other campers were staring at him with wide eyes, having seen what he did with the waters of the lake. Thus, it was left to Chiron to explain. That Percy, said Chiron, his tone displaying that he too was shaken by what had just transpired, was a hellhound. Normally, they patrol the fields of punishment in the underworld. Seeing one here is most unusual. As were the abilities you displayed here today. What do you mean? Asked Percy, but before more words could be spoken a glowing light appeared above his head, causing the assembled campers to gasp, what's going on? It is determined, said Chiron seriously. Curious about what was happening, Percy looked up above his head and, though it was fading away, saw a glowing green symbol of a trident floating there, shining its light down on him. One by one, the other campers began to kneel in respect, though the Ares campers were a bit begrudging about it, allowing Chiron to make a declaration. Hail Perseus Jackson, said Chiron as he kneeled and held his arm across his chest in a salute, son of Poseidon, Earthshaker, Stormbringer, and God of the Sea. After that rather eventful match of Capture the Flag, things happened rather quickly. With the revelation of Percy's lineage as the son of Poseidon, the teenage demigod was moved to Cabin 3, and the very next day, he was called to the big house and subsequently sent on a quest to retrieve Zeus's missing master bolt, which had been stolen by an unknown party and could provoke a war between the Olympian gods. The fallout of this incident had brought a thunderstorm to Camp Half-Blood that persisted past the departure of Percy's group on their quest, resulting in dampening of the mood around camp. However, a demigod's life must go on and that is exactly what happened for the residents of Camp Half-Blood. There was a bright side for Naruto, though. A rather unexpected one at that. One day, at mealtime, Naruto found a steaming bowl of Ichiraku Miso Ramen waiting for him at his seat. The blonde was understandably surprised, as were his demigod siblings, who had received the usual fare of lean-cut barbecue, fruit, and bread with cheese from the dryads that were serving them. The only hint about the source was a folded note next to the bowl reading because you cared, and sighed with the kanji for fire, huo. Not sure what was going on, but deciding not to look a gift horse in the mouth, Naruto had followed his cabinmates up to the central brazier where he spooned off some of the broth, and a slice of the pork, into the fire, adding a silent prayer of thanks to whatever deity had allowed him to enjoy his favorite meal again, in addition to the prayers he always sent to his father and grandmother of course. Things continued like this for a few days, with the campers making the best of the weather to practice combat training in harsher environments, though Naruto's siblings were called on more than once to use their healing abilities to treat several minor colds among the other demigod teens. All this changed though soon enough. The weather had been a bit better that morning, with things being merely dark and overcast instead of rainy and windy, which was a nice change for the campers, though a far cry from happy days. The campers had just finished breakfast in the dining pavilion when suddenly, there was a brilliant flash of light near the central brazier as the kanji for gate, men, appeared in the air, before forming into a shining torii gate with a glowing portal within. As everyone watched, a man in a black business suit and reflective sunglasses stepped through, causing the gate to vanish into motes of light. Lord Futadama, said Chiron as he walked forward and bowed to this newcomer, to what do we owe the honor of your visit? I come bearing a message from Amaterasu Sama, said the now identified Kami in a formal tone, a message for her grandson. For me? asked Naruto in surprise as he rose from his seat at the Apollo table. 
indeed, said the kami as he turned to the blonde shinobi, Amaterasu-sama wished to keep informed of your well-being, a valid concern considering your life before here, and as such, requested the chief of divine affairs, Aim no Koyon, to perform a divination as to the recent unrest surrounding this camp. After seeing the results, Amaterasu-sama has decided to send you on what the Greek pantheon refers to as a quest. Wait, said Mr. D from his seat at table 12, would this be seen as the Shinto pantheon interfering with Greek affairs? Hardly, replied Futadama as he regarded the god of wine with a minute amount of disdain, as Uzumaki-san is the grandson of Amaterasu, he falls within her jurisdiction. Furthermore, due to his heritage as a son of Apollo, Uzumaki-san is capable of involving himself in the affairs of the Greek pantheon without it being an overstep of the Shinto pantheon's boundaries. Seems to check out, nodded Mr. D with a grunt, I assume there is a prophecy or something involved then. Indeed, said Futadama as he reached into his suit jacket and withdrew a scroll. Unfurling said scroll, the kami placed a hand over the unrolled parchment, causing several cards to appear. Seeing the look of disbelief and recognition Naruto was giving the scroll, Futadama allowed a small smirk to appear on his face as he let out a subtle chuckle, catching the blonde's attention. You didn't think the shinobi invented the art of fuenjutsu, did you? He asked Naruto with a hint of smugness, the kami of the Shinto pantheon were using the art for eons before, and it was Amaterasu-sama that taught a simplified version to the one you refer to as the Sage of Six Paths. In any case, said the kami as he addressed Chiron and Mr. D, I have here the results of the divination performed by Aim no Koyon in the translation we have gleaned so far. Reaching for the first two cards, Futadama turned them over to reveal the kanji Shien and Huang Quan. Kami and Yomi, dictated Futadama, referring to the god of the underworld. Hades? said Chiron in surprise, curious considering the quest we recently sent Perseus on. Quite, agreed Futadama as he reached for the nest two cards, revealing the kanji Do and Ying helmet and shadow, translated the kami. The helm of darkness, said Chiron, curious, nodding, Futadama reached out and flipped over the final card, revealing the kanji Zan Jung, but inverted. War, explained Futadama, inverted. From what we can interpret, the prophecy indicates that Uzumaki-san must seek an audience with the god Hades in regards to his helm of darkness in order to prevent war. That does indeed make some sense, said Chiron especially considering we just sent young Percy Jackson on a quest to prevent an Olympian civil war by traveling to the underworld himself. Indeed, said Futadama as he waved his hand, causing the scroll and cards to vanish, and if I am correct in my assumptions, there is a timetable that his quest was set to? The summer solstice meeting, said Chiron in confirmation, if the quest isn't completed by then, it could very well start a war. Then I suggest you not dawdle, Uzumaki-san said Futadama as the kami turned toward the blonde demigod, you have a long journey ahead of you. Indeed, agreed Chiron, now then Naruto, who will you have accompanying you? No, I beg your pardon, said Chiron, surprised at being cut off by the visiting kami. Unfortunately, only Naruto-san shall be allowed on this quest, said Futadama as he adjusted his glasses with one hand, due to his nature as a child of the Shinto and Greek pantheons, only he will be able to perform this task without it becoming a conflict of interest for either side. This is troubling, said Chiron, three is a powerful number and demigods that undergo quests with more or less than that number making up their party tend to face more trials and misfortune than any others. I'm afraid that, due to the ancient laws that currently restrict the interference of deities from one pantheon in quests being undertaken by demigods of another, Uzumaki-san must act alone here. Very well said Chiron with a sigh, Naruto, you are excused from camp activities for the day. Use this time to prepare for your upcoming journey, as you will be departing at sunset. Hi, said Naruto as he nodded to the centaur, slipping into shinobi mode due to the seriousness of the situation. I wish you well on your journey, Uzumaki-san, said Futadama as he gave a respectful bow, the glowing Torii gate appearing behind him once again as he turned to leave, do be wary. There are many forces that would seek to end a demigod child of two pantheons. Remember your training, both from here and from your old home. It will serve you well. With that, the Shinto deity walked through the gateway and the gates themselves vanished into motes of light, leaving the gathered campers stunned into silence at this new development. After the eventful breakfast, Naruto began to prepare for his upcoming quest by gathering supplies from around camp. 
Eventually he made his way back to his bunk in cabin 7 where he stashed his shinobi gear. Pulling a trunk out from under his cot, Naruto pulled out several scrolls and unfurled them to reveal some basic fuinjutsu seals that he had prepared using the book of his parents' notes that Amaterasu had given him. Next, he pulled out a bundle of kanai that he had specially commissioned from Hephaestus' cabin after the announcement of the quest, which Beckendorf had been more than happy to help him craft in exchange for his aid in a future capture the flag match. The kanai were forged out of celestial bronze in order to allow them to target monsters and were otherwise virtually identical to the ones he had brought with him when he had been transported from the elemental nations to earth. Nodding to himself, Naruto sealed the items into the scrolls with a quick burst of chakra, and was just about to seal the scrolls into a fuinjutsu seal he had gotten tattooed onto his right arm. One of his demigod siblings was an aspiring tattoo artist when there was a bright flash and a quiver of arrows appeared on his bed with a bow sitting next to it along with a folded note. Unfolding the note, Naruto couldn't help but smile at the doodle of a smiling Minato giving a thumbs up along with the words, good luck, now knowing that this was a gift from his father to help him on his first solo mission. Sealing the bow away as well, he slung the quiver around his shoulder, and was just about to make his way out, when he saw one last parcel as well in the form of a jar of what appeared to be soldier pills from his world with a note attached. These should serve you well on your upcoming journey. They are laced with ambrosia to better heal your body and restore your energy, so use wisely. They may taste good, but don't eat them all in one place. Stay safe, Huo smiling. Naruto realized that these soldier pills had been gifted by the same mysterious person that had arranged for ramen to be available for him at camp dinner. Curious as to the flavor, he took one of the pills and took a small bite, before his eyes widened and he had to fight to hold back tears at the nostalgic flavor of Ichiraku ramen. Strangely enough, it wasn't any specific ramen though. No, what caused him to get so emotional was that the flavor simply seemed to invoke an almost forgotten memory of him as a child one rainy night, when Tucci ushered him into the store and provided him with his first steaming bowl, while refusing any payment the blonde had offered which had brightened a rather dismal day and started a lifelong friendship and patronage to the humble shop. Wiping his eyes, Naruto sealed the jar of pills away as well and headed to the entrance of camp where Chiron was waiting with the camp's head of security, Argus, the hundred-eyed giant. Argus here will take you as far as the Manhattan bus terminal, Chiron explained to the shinobi demigod, from there you will have to make your way to Los Angeles where the main entrance to the underworld is located. Unfortunately, we do not know the exact location, but I trust you will be able to find it. Remember to be wary, there are many beings out there that won't hesitate to hunt a lone demigod, so remember your training. With that, Naruto boarded the camp van and left the borders of Camp Half-Blood for the first time as he headed out on his first quest. As he made his way through the streets of the concrete jungle, Naruto marveled at the difference between New York City and Konoha. Instead of dirt roads and open skies, towering skyscrapers surrounded paved asphalt while metal vehicles, which Naruto had learned through his lessons at camp were called, cars, zipped by its speeds a shinobi would be hard pressed to match. Dear gods was he thankful that Chiron had seen fit to have Athena cabin practically pound the lessons in until he was up to date on all the modern advances that set this world apart from the elemental nations. Without those lessons getting him acclimated to the technology of the modern age, he would have been completely lost. As he reached the bus stop where he'd catch the first of several buses on the way to Los Angeles, he quickly pulled out some mundane money some friends of his from Hermes cabin had traded for drachma he had won in one of their secret poker matches, he had been subsequently banned from attending after cleaning them out in a few rounds, and counted out the bills needed to pay for the first leg of his trip to Los Angeles. After paying his fare for passage on the bus, Naruto found a seat near the back as he pondered about the reason for his being sent on a quest that seemed to parallel the one Percy had just been sent on. It was almost as if the two quests were connected in some way. Naruto shook his head to clear it of such thoughts. He was probably just being a bit paranoid, probably due to his experiences growing up in Konoha. His heart clenched as he remembered the betrayal and all the friends he would never see again. But he had a family now, and new friends. He would endure, after all, he was still a shinobi. The bus made another stop and several tall, muscular teens boarded, dressed in t-shirts and ripped jeans. Naruto watched as they found seats together near the center of the bus, and for some reason, his danger senses were beginning to flare like crazy. Naruto watched the teens as the bus continued on its route, trying to figure out why his danger senses were screaming at him, like when he had gotten eaten by that snake in the chunin exams. Making a decision, 
He got to his feet and made to leave the bus at the next stop, and much to his concern, the group of older teens followed him as he stepped off onto the streets. As he walked, he noted that the group kept on his tail despite the twists and turns he made, solidifying the notion that they were not to be trusted. Well, if they wanted to try anything, they'd have to catch him first. Darting down an alleyway, Naruto made a quick hand seal and performed a henge that transformed him into an old broom leaning against a wall, just as the group following him walked up. Where'd he go? Growled one of the teens, I saw him walk in here. How'd he just disappear? Snarled another. He can't have gone far, said a third teen, I can still smell him. I want demigod meat tonight, muttered a fourth, so let's find him. The teens, which Naruto was beginning to recognize as a species of giant that his Greek monster lessons had covered, filed out of the alley, leaving one of them behind to look around. Naruto waited patiently until the giant was distracted sifting through a dumpster to dispel his henge and quietly unseal the blade he received from his father before creeping up to the monster, intent on slaying it. Unfortunately, as he got close, the giant sniffed the air before whirling around and backhanding Naruto into a brick wall. Nice try. Little demigod, sneered the giant, you have quite the powerful scent. It smells delicious. I'm going to enjoy this. We'll see, Teme, growled Naruto as he reached for the Fuenjutsu tattoo on his arm. Acting quickly, Naruto unsealed a pair of kanai forged from celestial bronze and threw them at the monster, causing it to reel back in pain as the divine metal knives impaled him in the shoulder, allowing the blonde to leap up and drive his blade into the giant's chest, piercing its heart and turning it to dust. There he is! yelled one of the giants from the street, causing Naruto to curse and leap for the wall, channeling chakra into his palms and feet to stick to the surface as he quickly climbed up to the roof. Unfortunately, the monsters were not so easily shaken from their pursuit, as they used the fire escape to scale the building and follow Naruto onto the roof where the chase continued. Naruto kept ahead by pushing chakra to his legs to increase his speed and allow him to leap from rooftop to rooftop but the giant's monstrous strength allowed them to keep pace and follow the blonde demigod across the roofs. Coming upon a larger gap between buildings than before, Naruto went into a dive and rolled to his feet while unsealing the bow and quiver that his father had given him. Quickly notching an arrow and drawing back the string, Naruto let fly a celestial bronze-tipped arrow towards the giant as the monster was airborne, in the middle of leaping between the buildings. As the arrow left his fingers, Naruto felt a small drain on his chakra and the bronze arrowhead was wreathed in golden flames. The monster's eyes widened in surprise as the arrow impaled him between the eyes, the golden flames enveloping his form even as his physical body was reduced to dust, its soul being returned to Tartarus. That was unexpected, said Naruto as he glanced down at his bow, thanks, to chan It was probably his imagination, but he could have sworn that, for a moment, the sun shone just a bit brighter. Damn it. These cities are like a maze, groaned Naruto as he came to a stop and pulled out an atlas that he had managed to buy at a corner store. After his encounter with the giants, Naruto had decided to give public transportation a hard pass for the rest of his trip. Based on what he'd been told of the distance, he'd made longer trips on footback during his time as a Konoha shinobi. Best to keep away from enclosed metal capsules that moved at several dozen miles per hour where monsters could corner him with no way for him to escape without blowing his cover or endangering civilians. Besides, he could run almost as fast as some of those vehicles could drive. The downside though, was doing this forced him to have to navigate the urban and suburban areas of the United States with only this atlas to guide him. Still though, he had made good time, if he was reading the map correctly that is. Unfortunately, grow wwwl, ga, groaned Naruto as he gripped his stomach, so hungry. Yeah, his supply of mortal currency had just about run out and he didn't want to dip too much into his supply of soldier pills, as they were meant to be used for emergencies, not as field rations. Damn it, said Naruto with a sigh and a yawn, need to find some place to rest and something to eat. But where can I find something in this concrete jungle? Era era, said a feminine voice from behind Naruto, causing the blonde to jump, are you in need of assistance, good sir? Naruto spun around and immediately blushed when he saw the person standing there. She was an attractive woman with a slender body and pale, unblemished skin wearing a jet black blouse and skirt. Her black hair seemed to glisten in the light and also, something which Naruto certainly couldn't help but notice, she had a bust that only Tsunade had beat. Um, hi, said Naruto awkwardly. Hello, chuckled the woman, 
I don't mean to be rude, but I couldn't help but overhear your plight. If you wanted, I could offer you some help. I run a small bed and breakfast near here, and wouldn't turn away someone in need. I don't have any money, admitted Naruto as he collected himself. Not a problem, said the women with a smile, I'm sure we can work something out. As I said, I could never turn away someone in need. All right then, said Naruto with a smile, I'd be happy to accept your offer. With a smile, the woman led the blonde down the street, the son of Apollo not noticing a small spider hopping of his pack and scuttling off to join its brethren. You have a really nice place, commented Naruto as the lady led him to her BNB. The bed and breakfast turned out to be a building with a traditional Japanese theme, making it resemble a small ryokan in a way. There were shoji doors, tatami mats, and the communal dining room even featured a kotatsu. You can rest at the table, said the woman, I'll prepare some dinner for you. The first room at the top of the stairs is yours for the night. Thanks again, said Naruto, sorry I don't have any money to pay you with. This wasn't completely untrue, as he did have some emergency drachmi, but his mortal money had been spent buying dinner over the past few days. Who knew that ramen stands in New York were so expensive? Chuki and Ayame never charged him that much for ten bowls of miso char shao ramen. As I said earlier, said the woman with a smile as she headed for the kitchen, I'm sure we can work something out. You're a fit and able young man. I'd be willing to waive the fee for some help around the house. I should have dinner ready soon. Awesome, said Naruto as he had a seat at the table. Naruto found himself enjoying the atmosphere here in the BNB, the traditional Japanese decor strangely reminding him of Konoha, though he wasn't completely sure why, and it wasn't long before the woman returned with a tray holding rice, grilled fish, some soup, and tempura, along with a cup of tea. Here you go, said the woman, eat up, and let me know if you need seconds. Itadakimasu, said Naruto happily as he dug into the meal. Era era, you must have been hungry, said the woman with a musical laugh. You have no idea, replied the son of Apollo, this food is great. I'm glad you like it, said the woman, I cooked everything myself. You're really talented, said Naruto as he put down his utensils and stifled a yawn. You must be tired from your long day, said the woman as she hid a smile behind her hand, I recommend that you get some sleep. I'll wash up and you can work off your debt in the morning. Sounds good said Naruto with another yawn, thanks again for everything. As Naruto tiredly made his way to his room, he didn't see the smile the woman was sporting shift into something more sinister. You've really done it now, Gaki, growled the Kyubi from his cage as Naruto suddenly found himself in his mindscape. What do you want? groaned Naruto, I was just starting to relax too. Your carelessness will be your downfall, snarled the demon fox, you are in grave danger right now and need to escape, you're lucky I was able to bring you here to warn you before it was too late. What are you talking about? Asked Naruto, I'm just resting in that nice lady's place. Ignorant brat! Roared the Kyubi, that is no mere human. She reeks of spiders much like Orochimaru reeks of snakes. Her intentions towards you are certainly malicious. What do you care? Scoffed Naruto, wouldn't my death benefit you or something? TCH! Spat the Kyubi. Your bastard of a father tweaked the seal binding me and tied my existence to your own. If you die, then my life will end as well, thus it is in my best interest to keep you alive until I can one day escape. Fine then, said Naruto, but how do I wake up from here? That thing drugged you when you ate, growled the fox, if I hadn't pulled your conscious mind here before you completely went under, you may have never woken up again. Whatever she dosed you with is strong, but if I channel enough of my chakra through the seal and into your body, I should be able to force your metabolism to start burning it off. Do I have a choice? Asked Naruto with a frown. No, said the fox with a smirk, this might sting a bit. Naruto grit his teeth as the Kyubi let out a roar, causing a red tide to flow out through the water and surround his feet before flowing into him. It was then the pain started. As the Kyubi's chakra flowed into him, it Naruto felt like his nerves were on fire, filled with molten lava and connected to a live wire that was discharging hundreds of volts into his body. As he let out a yell, he suddenly found himself being pulled away from his mindscape and the dark sewer tunnel faded away to black. Naruto let out a pained gasp as he was jolted into waking, but as he tried to get his bearings, he suddenly found that he couldn't move. Looking down at his prone form, Naruto found, to his horror, 
that his body had been wrapped in a cocoon that was being woven by hundreds of tiny spiders. Looking around, he saw even more spiders covering the walls and scampering across a large web that had been woven through the room, with his gear scroll hanging from one of the strands. Focusing, he began to call on the biju chakra that his tenant had been pumping through his body, transforming him slightly as his whisker marks became more pronounced and his fingernails extended into claws as a fox-shaped shroud of caustic crimson chakra formed around him. Using this shroud, he burned away the various spiders crawling over his body and allowing him to tear his way out of his bindings with the enhanced strength the chakra shroud gave him. Breathing heavily, Naruto forced back the Kyuubi's chakra, causing the shroud to fade as the mild burns on his skin from the caustic nature of the chakra began to heal. Quickly grabbing his things, he unsealed the sword his father gave him and made for the exit, but a voice from above him made him freeze. Oh my, said the voice of the woman from earlier, but now it had a slight distortion, making it sound more akin to that of a monster's, you certainly have spirit, little one. Good. I enjoy a meal with some spice to it. Naruto spun around and looked up to see the woman from earlier, except she had undergone a drastic change. Her skin was now bone white and her fingers had grown sharp claws. She had gained four new eyes on her face and all six were glowing bright red and her mouth was now filled with razor sharp fangs that dripped with venom. Finally, her lower body was replaced with that of a giant spider, with its eight legs clinging to a web that lined the ceiling. I told you she smelled of spiders, Ninjin, growled the Kyuubi from within the seal. What the hell are you? yelled Naruto as he took a step back, inching towards the door. I am a Jorogumo, answered the now identified monster, and boys like you are the perfect food for me and my children. I shall indeed savor this meal. Not if I can help it, said Naruto as he made a hand seal, cage bunshin no jutsu. Naruto created several copies of himself and they leapt at the Jorogumo, blades in hand, but the yokai simply spat webbing from her maw that snared the cage bunshin, allowing her to pull them in close and dispel them with slashes from her claws. She then turned her attention towards the original, and was forced to scamper across the ceiling to dodge several arrows wreathed in golden flames that Naruto had quickly fired from his bow. A feeble attempt, young one, spat the female monster as she inspected the damage done to her web, but ultimately futile. However, you will pay dearly for what you've done to my home. The Jorogumo then spat out several globs of webbing at the demigod, forcing Naruto to dodge as they impacted against the tatami mats and remained stuck there as hazards he would have to avoid. Naruto quickly unsealed a few celestial bronze kanai and threw them with deadly speed and precision, causing the Jorogumo to shriek in pan as they stabbed into her shoulders. Quickly making several more cage bunshin, Naruto had them rush the monster while he hung back with a final one and prepared another attack. Focusing on what he had learned before leaving the elemental nations, Naruto began to gather chakra around his hand while the cage bunshin at his side focused on shaping and containing the spiraling chakra as it formed a spherical shape in his hand. You are beginning to annoy me, young one, growled the Jorogumo as she ripped the kanai out of her body and tossed them aside before spitting webbing out of her mouth that strung up the cage bunshin attacking her, leaving them open as the monster impaled them with her claws, dispelling them, you will die now and I will feast on your remains. We'll see about that said Naruto as he dispelled his final cage bunshin and jumped at the monster with the spiraling sphere of chakra in his hand, Rasengan. Naruto slammed the sphere of chakra into the stomach of the monster, causing her to let out a shriek of pain as the attack blasted her upwards through the roof of the building as the sphere grinded away at her torso, carrying her into the sky before finally tearing her body apart before finally dissipating. Naruto breathed hard as the adrenaline began to subside and he began to feel the effects of pushing his body so hard as well as the effects of forcing the Kyuubi's chakra through the seal to burn off the drugs he had been dosed with. As the monster's remains crumbled to ash as they fell to earth, Naruto decided to make himself scarce before any mortal law enforcement came to investigate the fight. Unsealing his map, he jumped through the hole he had made and continued on his trek to find the entrance to the underworld. Naruto let out a groan as he fought back the urge to throw his map down on the ground in frustration. He had been traveling for several of days since the Jorogumo incident, and he was no closer to finding the entrance to the underworld than when he left camp. He had managed to trade a few drachmi for some mortal money at one of those shops that offers to buy gold from people, so he was able to at least find meals for himself every night, but he still had no way to get to Los Angeles and thus finding the entrance to the underworld. Dear Kami, groaned Naruto out of habit, my first quest and I can't even get to my destination. 
Now what am I supposed to do? Sorry to San, Ba San, he apologized with a sigh. Suddenly though, that reminded him of something Chiron had explained to him during his lessons back at the camp, when he was undergoing what basically amounted to remedial classes about the Greek myths and the gods involved in them. Flashback, Chiron, Naruto asked the immortal centaur as they walked through the camp, why do so many campers end up as unclaimed? Don't the gods love their children? It's a complicated subject, said the trainer of heroes, do not misunderstand, while the gods are known for their flings and dalliances, he paused with a shake of his head as thunder boomed over the camp, the gods, for the most part, truly care for their children, yet the ancient laws prevent them from directly caring for and intervening on behalf of their children's lives. However, Chiron continued as the blonde demigod made to protest, that does not mean they don't find ways to circumvent this law. When a parent, god or mortal, truly cares for their child, they will always hear their calls for help. If ever a time comes that you need their help, the gods will hear your prayers. Flashback end. I guess it's as good an idea as any, sighed Naruto before kneeling down and clapping his hands together, to San. I don't know if you can hear me, but I could really use some help with this. I need to find an entrance to the underworld to stop a war, but I'm running out of time and options. Please, I need some help. Naruto was pulled out of his prayers when a large swan landed in front of him, nearly startling the teenage demigod. Before he could shoo it away though, the swan reached out and snapped up his map with its beak before flying off, forcing Naruto to give chase. Get back here you dumb bird! Naruto yelled as he chased after the avian thief, but despite his best efforts, the swan kept ahead of the blonde demigod until it came upon what looked like a donut shop with a marquee showing the shop's name in big black letters though Naruto's dyslexia made it difficult to read. His concerns were elsewhere though as the bird flew over the shop and into the shop's back alley. Groaning to himself, Naruto quickly glanced around to make sure nobody was watching, and then leapt up and over the side of the shop, dashing across the roof, before landing in a crouch in the alley behind the building. Looking around, he saw the swan sitting next to a large manhole that had been boarded up, with his map firmly held in its beak. Naruto was just about to make a grab for his stolen belonging, when he felt a chill go down his spine, his combat senses going into overdrive, like someone was slowly raising a sharpened blade to cut him down. Move brat. The Kyubi suddenly yelled from his mindscape, prompting Naruto to dive forward into a roll, just barely avoiding getting bitten by a serpentine head that had been inching up behind him. Whirling around Naruto paled at what he saw, a gigantic monster resembling a scaly lizard with nine diamond-shaped heads filled with razor-sharp teeth that were dripping with acidic venom. The Hydra, breathed Naruto as he remembered Shiron's lessons, crap. With a roar, the monster lunged at Naruto with its numerous heads, and the blonde just managed to avoid getting eaten by pulling off a quick kawarimi with that left the monster biting into a log. As it spat out the resulting splinters, which were already melting away from the Hydra's venom, Naruto quickly made several cage bunshin and drew forth his archery set as his copies readied their swords. Naruto's copies leapt forward swinging their blades, but the legendary monster lashed out with its numerous heads, dispelling many of his clones, but two managed to make it through the assault, swinging their tontos at one of the necks, decapitating it with ease. The fight was far from over though, as the decapitated neck promptly split in two down the middle and formed into two new necks, each with its own snarling head. Naruto swore mentally as he only then recalled the remedial combat and mythology lessons he had had his cage bunshin attend while he was in combat training. The Hydra of Legend had the ability to sprout two new heads for every one that was severed at the neck. The key to defeating one of these beasts was to burn the stump before the new heads could grow in its place. Jumping back to avoid the Hydra's snapping maws, Naruto quickly made several more cage bunshin and sent some of them to distract the Hydra's many heads while a remaining handful readied their swords and leapt at the Hydra once again. The summoned cage bunshin pulled out their celestial bronze shuriken and began to launch them at the beast's various heads, the spinning blades cutting shallow gashes in the monster's skin that dripped acidic, toxic blood, causing the Hydra to recoil in pain. Taking advantage of this, Naruto's copies leapt at one of the beast's long necks and managed to sever another head with the razor-sharp edges of their blades. This time though, Naruto didn't give the beast a chance to recover, as before the severed head had even hit the ground, the blonde demigod quickly notched and fired an arrow from his bow, the enchanted projectile igniting mid-flight and burying itself into the stump, causing the fire to cauterize the wound and prevent a new pair of heads from growing in its place. Alright, cheered Naruto. 
How do you like me now, ugly? The Hydra, in fact, did not like him at all, and it expressed that dislike by lunging at the young shinobi with all its remaining heads in an attempt to tear him limb from limb with its jaws. Naruto let out a yelp as he leapt away from the Hydra and quickly dashed up the wall of the alley by quickly channeling chakra to his feet so they can stick to the flat surface, just barely avoiding the razor sharp fangs as the Hydra snapped at his heels. Okay. I think I just made it angry, said Naruto before dodging several globs of venom that the Hydra had spat at him from its various heads, yup. It's angry. Naruto quickly tried to take another head out of play using the same strategy as earlier. But when he sent his summoned cage Bunshin to distract the Hydra and sever one of its heads. The beast proved that it had learned from its earlier mistake and dispelled the copies that were preparing to throw their shuriken with blasts of acidic venom spat from several of its heads. While the remainder took care of the ones that were reaching for their swords by lashing out and biting into them as the beast of old lunged forward with surprising speed, before turning its attention back towards the original and spitting acid at him as it tried to clamber up the wall Naruto was sticking to, causing the blonde to quickly scramble up higher to avoid its jaws. Right, muttered Naruto, that didn't work. Looks like it's ugly and smart. Perfect. Time for a new plan. Taju Cage Bunshin no Jutsu. Naruto called out as he placed his hands in a cross seal, summoning several dozen cage bunshin that proceeded to draw their swords and bum rush the hydra, with one remaining behind at Naruto's side. Let's go, said Naruto as he held out his hand and started channeling his chakra. As he did so, his clone worked to mold and shape the chakra, containing it within Naruto's palm as a spiraling sphere of pure compressed chakra formed in his grip. Once the sphere was stable, the cage Bunshin dispelled and Naruto launched himself off the wall, landing in a crouch in front of the Hydra, before thrusting the sphere into its chest. Rasengan! yelled Naruto as the sphere tore into the Hydra's scales and sent the beast flying back into the donut shop, tearing through the building before exploding into dust as the sphere popped and blew the monster apart. Great, breathed Naruto as he looked at the ruins of the donut shop, looks like that took care of it. Now, where's my map? Suddenly, Naruto heard a familiar squawk and saw the swan from earlier sitting atop the boarded up manhole. Looking at the blonde demigod square in the eye, the bird tapped its beak onto the wooden planks several times before spreading its wings and taking flight, leaving Naruto alone. What was that about? Asked Naruto as he moved closer to where the bird had been standing, seemed pretty weird. Naruto then noticed something carved into one of the boards sealing the hole and, upon looking closer, saw that it was the word, Alcyonian, written in ancient Greek. Wait a minute, said Naruto as he thought back once again to the lessons on Greek myths he'd had back at camp, it couldn't be. Pulling out a kanai, Naruto pried the boards off the hole, revealing a deep pit that was filled with dark, murky water, but there seemed to be a flickering light deep within the watery depths. Well, said Naruto, if this is what I think it is, then it's my best chance to get there. Sure as hell hope I'm not wrong, because that'll suck. Taking a deep breath, Naruto dove into the pit and into the pool of water within, swimming deeper and deeper as he pressed on towards the bottom and the light he could see in the distance. Naruto swam and swam, and it was starting to seem like he had made a huge mistake, when suddenly he broke the surface with a gasp and found him in a cavern made of dark stone, treading water in a small pool. He had arrived in the underworld at last. The end. Remember to subscribe and like this video. See you in the next video.